20 years ago, the world turned into a post-apocalyptic wasteland due to the shutdown of the internet and electricity. People, quite literally, lost their minds. Surviving cities erected tall walls to protect themselves from the madness, and all criminals were cast beyond their borders to drown in the abyss of prevailing chaos. However, even in such dire circumstances, there remained brave individuals who began delivering valuable cargo from one fortified city to another. One of these daredevils was John Doe. Having equipped his car with firearms, he bravely engages in battle with those who try to seize his cargo. The inhabitants of the cities to which couriers deliver packages have dubbed them milkmen. While delivering another order in Francisco, John looks at the guard with surprise, who informs him that their senior officer wishes to meet him personally. The guy can't believe his ears, after all, he has never been invited inside the gates in any city. In order to avoid contamination and other troubles, after undergoing a thorough disinfection and inspection, the milkman escorts Craven. The woman treats the guest to beer, which is considered a luxury in the conditions of the new world. And afterwards, she informs him that she wants to hire him for a job. She offers John to bring the cargo from New Chicago. And in return, he will receive the citizenship of their city. Raven invites the milkman to dinner, where she introduces him to her husband, as well as their newborn daughter. Seeing the clean house, trying homemade food, and seeing a baby for the first time, John can't believe his luck. He agrees to this deal. He needs to deliver the cargo within 10 days, but without looking inside the package. As soon as John's car leaves the city limits, Raven disgustedly orders to take the child to its mother, and to the man who played her husband, she gives the instruction to take the payment and leave far away. Meanwhile, the brother and sister, forced to survive among criminals and misfits, fall into the clutches of Agent Stone. He gives the victims a choice, to be shot or to end their lives themselves. Unable to withstand such pressure, Loud grabs a gun and shoots himself in the head. However, his sister, Quaid, who lost a finger in one of the towns, is now forced to endure unbearable pain from the heated branding iron. Thus, Stone puts everyone who falls into his hands. John comes to a familiar person, Tommy, to buy a map from him. Hearing that the guy is planning to head east across the country, he warns him, assuring that things are much worse there than in their territories. Leaving his comrade behind, the young man sets off on his journey. However, having not driven more than a couple of miles, he encounters Quaid. She tries to take the young man's car away, but he offers determined resistance. Afterward, he tries to make peace. The attention of the pair is drawn to an approaching van with a clown-masked individual. Deciding to address their relationship issues a bit later, the young people point their weapons at the approaching car. In the second episode, two friends, Stu and Michael, fall into the hands of the Hannibals, who immediately drag them into their slaughterhouse. The men are saved from death by Agent Stone and his associates. He offers the men either to join his squad, which is trying to restore order beyond the cities, or to go free, but without a car and provisions. John and Quit, unable to deal with the deranged clown, escape. However, they are forced to make a stop to fix the punctured tires. And at that moment, the brute catches up with them. Realizing that there is no other way, the milkman tries with all his might to show interest in the nonsense the clown is talking about. The clown, understanding that he has an audience, loosened his grip and began to talk about his past life. He used to be an actor and now he dreams of putting on a show again, to hear the enthusiastic applause and see the excited looks. A man, living for over 20 years in an abandoned casino, communicates only with a paper bag, to which he gave the name Harold. John, realizing that he's facing an unhappy and sick man, tells him that his first memory is waking up in a car with a bloody head. He doesn't remember his parents or his past life. The only thing that has supported him all these years is his car, which he named Evelyn. During the conversation, the guy notices Quaid behind the glass in the room. The clown boasts that he caught her in the ventilation and put her in a glass cube to observe how she slowly dies of hunger. In addition to the girl in the room, there are several more corpses lying around. These are the bodies of those whom the maniac had managed to torment. John succeeds in persuading the maniac to release the poor girl, assuring him that if they all applaud together, his show will sound much better. The clown agrees, but warns that none of his audience has survived all three acts before. Agent Stone at this moment shows their new fighters their base. The men are delighted that they managed to wash in warm water and then sit down at the table with hot food. The leader assures them that it will always be like this, it's a kind of payment for their service. After a few hours, the friends are led to their first assignment. They are given weapons and instructed to shoot those who approach their food truck. Michael easily shoots a bullet into the head of one of them, but Stu only shoots in the legs. Another friend finishes off the second victim to cover his comrade. Stone reprimands the fighter who didn't follow the rules, assuring him that such a mistake will cost him his life in the future. Meanwhile, the clown begins his performance. After a lengthy and tedious act, he starts asking the audience for their opinion. And when John audaciously starts praising the maniac's talent, the latter brandishes his sword over him. Quaid saves the guy from death. For the first time since their meeting, the girl speaks up and expresses her honest opinion to the showman. She assures him that he played awfully and, if he tries, the show can truly become interesting. To achieve this, it's only necessary to step into the outside world. The clown, who has received honest criticism for the first time, releases the guests. And he himself sets off to create another chaos. Stu watches discreetly as Michael integrates into the new company. He himself cannot forget the faces of the people they had to kill. Emerging from the young man's contemplation, Shepard grabs him. He points to an approaching car and explains what exactly needs to be checked in people. John, seeing the checkpoint, tries to convince the guards that he's just a milkman. But when Cade spots Shepard, she attempts to shoot him. After all, he's the one who branded her and became the cause of her brother's death. However, the guards manage to react first and incapacitate the pair with stun guns. Due to the electric shock impact, the timer that Raven installed on John's wrist resets. Episode 3. 
Stu and Michael bring the detainees to a sort of compound. There, all drivers who travel without permission are offered to process the necessary paperwork. Those who refuse are forced to go to the mysterious red line. John and Quaid are brought in for questioning, where they are met by Stone. He displays the map found in the detainee's car and tries to ascertain from them the name of the person who composed it. After all, the man had been setting up roadblocks for years to control the roads and territories. And on this map, there's a route that goes around practically all of his checkpoints. Not receiving an answer, the agent gives the order to extract all the necessary information from the pair. John and Kate undergo brutal tortures, but after a couple of hours, they continue to remain silent, realizing that there is no other choice. Stone commands them to be sent down the red line. Stu leads the prisoners through a long passage that ends with a high cliff. Noticing the hesitation in the boy, John starts persuading him, and he agrees to a joint escape. While the men search for the car keys, Kate settles scores with Shepard, crushing his skull with the pistol's grip. Meanwhile, Stone reminisces about the day when the world went mad. It was in 2002, he had just begun his career as a police officer, when suddenly in an instant, all networks went down. This led to the uncontrollable release of weapons, plane crashes, the disconnection of mobile and satellite networks. People started hurriedly stocking up on provisions to weather the catastrophe, but the situation grew more complicated with each passing day. A pregnant neighbor of the officer came to him with a gun to take away the available weapons. At that moment, Stone was nearly giving up, but the hotel owner brought him to his senses. He reported that his hotel had been seized abruptly. Realizing that he had to sort things out, the man sets off into the very heart of hell. Seeing that his former colleagues had become the invaders, Stone couldn't believe his eyes. Instead of trying to restore order in the city, the policeman began self-seizures and looting. After brief negotiations, the officer shoots his entire gang. This became a pivotal moment for Stone, as now he knew what it meant to take a person's life. Meanwhile, the fugitives get into the car, but the drained battery prevents it from starting. Stewie starts pushing the car when the engine starts. Accidentally, he gets hit by the trunk lid and loses consciousness. Michael and other law enforcers who arrive direct their weapons at him, perceiving his actions as betrayal. Quaid tells about the place where she and her brother wanted to reach, the state of Topica. She asks John to take her there specifically, episode 4. After spending the whole day on the road, the couple enters the dark night. Unexpectedly, they fall into a trap of several trucks that leave them no choice and push the car into one of the trailers. Guests are greeted by Miranda Watts, who tells them about her tribe. They are nomads, and in order to avoid falling into the clutches of vultures, lawmen, or zealots, they never stop. Their whole life is spent on several trucks, which serve as both a home, work, and a place to rest. Miranda introduces the couple to her grandmother and explains why they picked them up. They need the services of a milkman to deliver medicine from a pharmacist to them. In exchange, they promise to equip their car with weapons and other means of protection, understanding that this is the only chance to reach New Chicago. John agrees. Having located the home of the enigmatic pharmacist, the young people find themselves facing a charming girl named Amber, who greets the guests with a smile. And then she offers refreshing drinks. After a couple of minutes, the couple is turned upside down, and they lose control of their bodies. The young hostess tries to figure out who they are and why they came to her house. She is already about to cut John's hand when he asks her to look into his pocket. Seeing a message from his grandmother, Amber's expression changes, and then she starts stuffing some herbs into the mouths of the guests to relieve paralysis. Having collected all the necessary plants, the couple sets off on a journey. At night, they stop at an abandoned movie theater to avoid falling into the clutches of scavengers. A heartfelt conversation ensues between them, and perhaps for the first time, Quida opens up about the emotions he feels due to his brother's death. In the morning, having reached the brotherhood on wheels, the young people observe as the grandmother gets into a convertible and consumes the prepared concoction. She explains that at present, not everyone can afford to die in silence and tranquility, while bidding farewell to their loved ones. As soon as she releases her final breath, her fellow tribe members roll the car out of the van. And then they detonate it, thus bidding farewell to the woman who had become family to them. It is thanks to her that several dozens of people were able to find a home and kindred souls. In honor of the grandmother, they organized a grand party. John, passing by accidentally, overheard Miranda calling Amber on the radio. The girls had a quarrel several years ago, and only now, when they lost their loved one, they decided to reconnect. Quaid watches the joyful people with admiration. John suggests that she stay with him, but the girl is determined to reach Topica. And by the next morning, the couple sets off on the journey again. Episode 5. The end of the journey is just a few miles away. When the couple is attacked by scavengers, who have finished off with them, they discuss their further actions. Quaid plans to bid farewell to the milkman and continue the journey alone, but John strongly disagrees. Seeing a pack of beer in the scavenger's car, the girl suggests having a drink. After a few sips, the guy loses consciousness. Quaid had mixed a flower taken from Amber into his drink, to venture into the city alone. Meanwhile, Stone gives his fighters an order, to find the fugitives and punish them publicly. After all, they didn't just escape, but killed his deputy. At the approach to the dam constructed by Agent Stone, the guards halt a van driven by a massive man wearing a clown mask. He effortlessly deals with the fighters and proceeds onto his territory. Quaid deceived John to save the young man's life. It turns out, Topica is not the city of dreams, but rather Stone's hideout, where she intends to deal with Shepard. For her, that's not enough, her main goal is the leader himself, who has delusions of being a god. Carefully sneaking into the car of the careless patrol officers, the girl finds herself in the heart of the city. However, she fails to remain unnoticed. One of the guards notices the missing finger and recalls that such a trait was present among the fugitives. John, meanwhile, regains his senses and sees a disgusting half-naked old man. 
The old man tries to calm his victim, but the guy turns out to be faster, under the sweepers of the car. He finds a note from Quaid and realizes that she has dared to commit the biggest folly of her life. Tough guy Stu is sitting in the waiting room together with those who are supposed to go through the red line. At that moment, a clown bursts into the room and starts tearing the policeman to pieces. Seeing that the inmates are applauding him, he becomes delighted and feels sympathy for them, especially sweet-toothed Stu. He helps him break free from the handcuffs and even offers his friendship. And when the man agrees, he starts pondering where to go next. Stu shows the map and suggests going to the other checkpoints, where hundreds of prisoners await a miraculous rescue. Moreover, behind Stu's back, an entire squad of fans, whom he saved from certain death, is forming. Meanwhile, Stone receives a message that the girl has infiltrated the city. He tunes his radio to her frequency and invites her for negotiations. However, instead of a conversation, the agent and the desperate Quaid engage in a battle on cars. Luck shifts from one to another in succession, but Stone proves to be more prepared. He sabotages the girl's car, causing it to flip over, leaving her barely alive. Quaid manages to escape from the wreckage when John comes to her aid. He launches the sheriff's car with his sole rocket, then loads the girl into his vehicle and departs. In the sixth episode several years ago, Laudy and Quaid worked on plantations, aiming to improve their lives. The girl secured a contract for herself and her brother. According to its terms, they needed to serve the owners for four years. After this period, they would be able to live freely and comfortably on the seaside. After three years, Quaid enters a fast food cafe together with her mistress. The mistress boasts to her friend about her new jewelry, pointing with a servant's finger. Other patrons also sit accompanied by slaves, who are not allowed to speak. Moreover, any part of their bodies can be cut off. The majority of exhausted young men and women sit without fingers on their hands and feet, someone has lost an ear, and someone has even had their nose cut off. Having become silent and submissive, Quaid sees that her brother is standing behind the counter. Lord schemes to find a way to be alone with his sister and finally embrace her. He tries to encourage her by informing her that according to the contract, there's only one year left, and they will be together again. However, their conversation is interrupted by the sound of a gunshot. One of the slave women has stolen a pistol and demands to be released. After all, the stipulated four years on paper have already expired. Realizing that it's all a deception, she starts shooting, but the city guards quickly get rid of the rebel. In the evening, the owner of the tavern pushes Lord onto the street, scolding the young man for talking to the girl. He cuts off Lord's ear and plans to hand him over to the cleaners. But in that moment Quaid appears and kills the scoundrels. Thus began their journey, at the end of which they hope to find a better life. Waking up from fainting and memories, the girl realizes that John took her away from Tropica. She lunges at the guy with her fists because he didn't let her finish what she had started killing Stone. Their scuffle turns into a passionate kiss. And after that, well, you know what happens in her act of love, lying in a pool with balloons. The couple discusses the future. John suggests to Quaid to go with him to New Chicago for a package, to later stay together in New San Francisco. The girl takes the proposal in a hostile manner, leading to a scandal. After remaining silent for several hours, the young people eventually begin to converse, enjoying each other's company. Waking up in the morning, John doesn't find Quaid, and thinks that she ran away again. Not wanting to waste time, he hastily gets ready and heads to the car. With a smile, the guy observes as the girl loads supplies into the trunk, assuring him that there are still many tasks ahead of them. This indicates that she's willing to tie her life to the young man, and embark on this journey. Episode 7, 1989. Within the framework of the TV show, a young actor is displeased that a new character has appeared in their sitcom. This is an ordinary dog, but it enjoys furious popularity among the audience. The boy cannot handle his emotions and thrusts knitting needles into the animal's belly right before the astonished eyes of the audience. John and Quaid reach New Chicago. They stand in front of a massive wall, in front of which are deep ditches filled with water. After throwing a stone towards the gates, they see the nearby booth opening, and a voice from the loudspeaker greets them. It points to a small object that needs to be delivered to Raven. Having taken the package, the young people head to New San Francisco. Meanwhile, Stone receives a message from his fighters that several checkpoints have been attacked by Sweet Tooth. He smashes the soldiers to pieces, frees the prisoners, and moves on and on. His army grows like a snowball, and his main ally is Stewie himself, the crazy squad. At the same time, Sweet Tooth arrives at the former psychiatric hospital where his parents sent the clown. There he spent all his childhood and youth. Judging from the newspaper reports, Sweet Tooth is the very boy who killed the dog during the filming in 1989. Stewie looks at the two skeletons with apprehension, as the healthy guy starts introducing him to his mother and stepfather. He himself tells how he tracked them down when the end of the world began and imprison them to take revenge. Leaving the room, Sweet Tooth looks in horror at a pile of corpses. Stone's soldiers shot his entire squad and are now firing at the leader. 
Hiding from the bullets, Stewie encounters Michael, who remembers how his friend saved him from Sweet Tooth's clutches. He agrees to join their ranks and go against Stone. John and Kuwait stop at a milkman's parking lot to rest and replenish their supplies of fuel and provisions. There they come across Mary, a former girlfriend of the guy. She has also become a transporter, and now tells which places are worth being cautious of. While John consults his colleagues to determine the safest route to get to New San Francisco, Quaid indulges herself in a hot shower. At the exit, she encounters Mary, who attempts to find out how serious her relationship with John is. Having received no answers, the girl heads towards the guy, and he accidentally lets slip about the mysterious package. Deciding that the young man isn't worthy of a better life, Mary talks about New San Francisco to the other milkmen, and they all converge on the couple, desiring to seize the package and gain citizenship of the city. John and Quaid manage to fend off the angry crowd of colleagues and hurriedly leave the parking area. Just as their car disappears from sight, one of the milkwomen sends a message to Stone. Gathering his most loyal followers, Stone embarks on a pursuit of the couple who have become a thorn in his side. In episode 8, John and Quaid discuss the life awaiting them in New San Francisco. The girl notices a charred photo under the visor depicting a little boy with parents. The faces of the adults are not visible as they all suffered from the fire. At some point, a gust of wind carries the photo away, forcing the couple to stop and search for it. As they make their way back to the car, the young people spot several representatives of the Svato's plan. They manage to kill two of them, but a third one, at that very moment, kidnaps Evelyn. John is incredibly distraught. Not only has he missed the opportunity to deliver the package on time, but he has also lost his beloved car, which had become an integral part of his life. Walking along the road, the couple hears the tolling of bells and heads in that direction. Wearing masks similar to those worn by the clan, the young people infiltrate their camp. They observe as people indulge in base pleasures, take forbidden substances and alcohol. Afterward, they examine their trophy, seeing how the leader tries to use it to his advantage. Seeing this, John can't stand it anymore and speaks out. Unable to tolerate such rudeness, the man challenges him to a battle. Recognizing that his partner won't manage against the opponent, Quaid takes matters into her own hands, capitalizing on the fact that everyone is engaged in the fight, and she hijacks a nearby car. She tries to persuade John to leave and escape, but he refuses, assuring her he can't abandon Evelyn. After expressing her opinion, the girl departs. The young man recalls his first sight of the car, back when he was a child who woke up in the vehicle, unable to remember even his own name. He only found charred photos. Later, he had to flee from a deranged woman who needed the car. The boy hid in the woods for several days, until he spotted a beautiful car among the branches and bushes. In the car's interior were several cans of food, CD discs, and glossy magazines. Little John spent some time in the car before he was attacked by crazed individuals. Frightened, he leaped behind the steering wheel, and fortunately, the engine started. Escaping from his pursuers, the boy reached an auto junkyard, where he found new parts for his rescuer, and most importantly, a plate with the name Evelyn. Since then, she became the meaning of his life and his best friend or companion. But now, as the leader of the Holy Ones clan set fire to her, she exploded. Nervously, from a distance, Kuwait saw a pillar of flames. Convinced that John had perished, she drove away, unable to hold back tears. Meanwhile, he himself gazed sadly and mournfully, at what remained of his beloved Evelyn. Episode 9. Michael is being unloaded at one of the checkpoints, and they see that all the fighters have been killed. A dog collar that delivers an electric shock in case of disobedience is around his neck. Sweet Tooth assures that great deeds await them, attempting to prove that they are better than stone. At some point, the clown orders everyone to get into the van. After dousing them with gasoline, he orders them to set themselves on fire. At a specific moment, Kuwait attempts to find the right road, but gets distracted by the map and ends up in a ditch. Right in front of her, a stranger appears, seemingly trying to help. He listens to the girl's story and then shares his own experiences. However, this doesn't prevent him from aiming a gun at Kuwait and demanding her backpack to spare her life. A van pulls up, saving her its Miranda and Ember, whom they had recently met at the mobile camp. They take Kuwait on board, where John is already waiting for her. As it turns out, he found an old car with a radio and remembered the girl's conversation on the day of their last meeting so he asks them for help. The guy confesses his feelings and asks Quaid for forgiveness. After receiving a dose of reproaches and punches, he heads to the new car. They equip the vehicle with everything necessary, and at that moment they come under gunfire from lawmen. Miranda is resolute, so she suggests that the pair accompany them to the city border. The sedan accompanied by a truck lures Stone into a trap, but all the agent's plans are thrown off by Sweet Tooth. He bursts onto the parking lot, 
and orders Stu to set fire to his head. Thus, with his head ablaze, the crazed clown approaches Stone directly. In the 10th episode, on the former racetrack, an incredible number of cars gathers. Miranda drives a sports car out of the van and rushes into the thick of events while Ember drives the truck to help her friend. John attempts to catch Stone, but he proves to be craftier. He launches a rocket at the couple's car. Miranda saves them from death, taking the projectile with her. Racing at incredible speed, she makes a circle and then veers to the side, causing the rocket to collide with one of the lawmen's cars. Meanwhile, Sweet Tooth, noticing Michael's attempt to kill him, seizes the boy and orders Stu to shoot his friend. However, the hefty man aims the weapon at the clown and fires, then jumps out of the van along with Michael. Stone, aiming to deal with the enemies, shoots at an approaching van, and one of the bullets hits Ember. Hearing through the radio that she's injured, Miranda falls into despair. At the same time, the wounded Sweet Tooth with his hair on fire, leaps onto the road and lands on Stone's hood. Eager to finally get rid of the insane maniac, Stone shoots at him as soon as he lands on the road. He is immediately knocked down by Stu and Michael, who manage to take control of one of the cars. John and Kuwait attempt to escape from the melee, but the agent tails them. Not wanting to run from the law anymore, the girl turns her car around and heads for a head-on collision. A special platform on their car allows them to launch Stone's car and flip it over from the impact. The young people lose consciousness. Regaining her senses, Kuei finds herself in the hands of an agent. He keeps her in his sights. However, as John awakens, he saves his partner by embedding an axe in the man's face. Seeing his agony, the girl leaves him a pistol with a single bullet, offering him a choice. A slow and agonizing death or a swift exit to another world. That's exactly what Stone did with her brother. As the departing couple hears the sound of a gunshot indicating that Stone chose the second option and shot himself in the head. Miranda rushes to the wrecked truck. There, she finds Ember, who survived only thanks to their assistance help. She, on the other hand, succumbed to the injuries she sustained. Promising that those responsible for her death will be punished, the friends get into a sports car and drive away. John's car pulls up to the gates of New San Francisco just a minute before the agreed time. Raven personally greets the milkman and his companion. After taking the package, she can congratulates the guy on acquiring a home, but upon hearing that he plans to take the girl with him, the woman informs him that it's impossible. Hearing this, John declares that in that case, he refuses the offer. Kuei draws a pistol and points it at him, ordering him to go into the city. She doesn't want to become the cause of the collapse of the dream that has been his whole life. To prove the seriousness of her intentions, the girl shoots the guy in the arm, and the security immediately whisks him away behind the wall to provide assistance. Meanwhile, Quaid herself gets into the car and drives away. Reoven opens the package and discusses with her assistants the feet of the milkman. It turns out he delivered an ice cream jar that the woman loves. All of this was just a test to begin preparing the guy for a new position. A month later, John recovers from the injury and enjoys a good life. He lives in a cozy apartment, sleeps on a soft bed, eats delicious food, and even makes friends all very nice and friendly with the guy. They wish to make his life in their city as comfortable as possible. However, all of this is just an illusion. Riven ordered the residents to play their roles to make the guy accustomed to the new life and never want to change it again. All of this is to make him the woman's personal driver. Quaid chose the path of Robin Hood. She began robbing milkmen, taking away half of their goods, and distributing it to those who are forced to endure a miserable existence behind the wall. One day, John comes to Riven and informs her that he wants to leave. Peaceful and measured life turned out not to his liking, and his thoughts constantly return to the days he spent with Quaid. Realizing that it's time to act radically, Riven takes the guy to the house, and reveals that his parents used to live there. She shows him a photo, and he recalls the faces of his relatives. It turns out that John had a sister. The family collapse happened at the moment when the father was teaching his son to drive a car. Hearing the noise, the man went to protect the family, and he told John to leave. Unable to control the vehicle, the board crashed into a pole and lost his memory. Even these arguments couldn't convince the young man to stay, and that's when Raven resorted to force. Under the aim of her chained dogs, they informed the guy that he must become a driver representing this woman's interests. It turns out that a race will take place in the country, where the goal is simply to reach the finish line alive. The one whose driver completes the task will receive a reward, fulfilling their most secret desire. Raven informs that John will become her pawn, which must bring her victory. Kuwait falls into the trap of a certain female clan. The leader of the girls in masks informs that she has been stalking her for a long time, as she is familiar with her brother, John Doe. That's all. I recommend this series for watching. Like and subscribe to not miss interesting movies.